Hey everybody, welcome back to the Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm joined by Tyler. How you doing, Tyler? Doing great. Good, good. Alright, so, I hear there's something new on your head. I, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I have no idea <laughs> what, is, what you mean. <laughs> like last night in that in the stream, I was like, Tyler, Meredith, <laughs> Kelly, where was <laughs> <where> your hair? <laughs> I loved it. Tyler Miranda Kelly. Yeah, like, this is going to be my new thing. And it, it, you had to spoil it by telling everybody your middle name. If you kept it a secret, I could have just kept calling you a new middle name every show. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it just can continually get more embarrassing until we get to the real one or something. <laughs> uh, well, you shaved your head. Now all of a sudden you're like, uh, you're, the, you're the DT of the Linux cast now. Because I'm never shaving my head. I'd look ridiculous. Well, it was really funny because I did that podcast and DistroTube was like the first person to join the stream. Yeah, I saw that. That was hilarious. I was like, hey, Dad, how you doing? <laughs> and like, like, that, was, that was like meta. It was great. Uh, so uh, other than shaving your head, have you been doing anything good in Linux this week? Um, I mean, I've been checking out... Um, or not really checking out. Well, yes, I've been I've been talking about trying out Void and looking into it a lot more. Um, I'm I'm thinking about giving it a shot. Um, not you know switching over to Void or anything. I'm done sort of distro hopping, but giving it a chance on my extra hard drive uh, here in the computer. Because again, I, when I do check out distros and stuff, I don't like doing them in VMs. I don't think there's a problem with doing that, but that's the most ideal scenario. So there's a lot of stuff. If you're going to have issues, you just won't know you'll run into. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about doing a video on that and just showing off Void. Cool. Uh, I, I think Void was the one that I couldn't get installed on mine because I thought about hopping to that at one point. Um, but I couldn't get installed. But so the distros a lot of the times don't really like you a lot of the times they don't and me too they, a lot of distros just seem to pick on us i don't it, know why it, it turns out that the one thing Lunduke is right about is that linux sucks <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> you know so <laughs> that's the one thing he's right about it's definitely linux sucks uh yeah so i've been i have debian back there on my laptop and for Three weeks, I didn't record a damn thing on it. I was just using it because I wanted to get my review all written and everything. And then I started shooting. I, I started recording. And it crashed. <laughs> it's like, it, like, I did an update. And I did a reboot after the update like you're supposed to. And I got to light DM. And it would not log into either BSPWM or XFC. Like, what the sh... Like, I've been using this for three weeks. <laughs> It's it's been stable as fuck, you know, and so you know I was like, fine, fine. I installed the unstable version and then upgraded, or I installed the stable version and upgraded to Buster. So I was like, you know what? Maybe this is a good sign. I'll just download the actual Bullseye ISO. And mm -hmm. after spending an hour trying to find the damn ISO because their website is horrible, um, I found it and I got it installed. I got, this time I chose the KDE version. And it connected to Wi-Fi and everything, and it will even install some software. Like it will it installed suckless tools, but it won't connect to the internet in the browser. It won't connect to the internet to install other programs like Nitrogen or anything. It gives me errors. I don't know what the hell's going on. Hmm. It's so stupid. I like for three weeks, uh, Debian was perfectly fine, and now I'm ready to sh to hmm. shoot the review, and it, it it's it's shit. So I've been messing around with that. And I also switched to Cute Browser, so uh, I'm still really liking Cute Browser. But somebody made a point today that you know you you left Firefox because the, some websites went render, and now you switched to a browser that actually won't render even more websites. That doesn't make you think you're going the wrong direction. Uh, but I commented back that I give Cute Browser a lot more slack because they don't get 400 million dollars from Google. So exactly, <laughs> like this is just a. Dude, code in a browser. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm perfectly willing to give him some slack, you know? <laughs> yep. He doesn't have 700 employees, uh, half of which make more money than uh, the president. You know? Quite frankly, Cute Browser has a, like, has a valid reason for sites not loading. You know, they don't have resources to fix that shit. Firefox, on the other hand, 
definitely does. Yeah, no excuse. Right. We're not going to get into the whole Mozilla thing. We need to not do that. So, all right. Uh, you know what? It's only like, what, eight minutes in and we're going to get to the contact information already. Holy moly. Like, uh, definitely. We're on top of it today. It definitely didn't happen last week. Last week it was like 30 minutes in and we got to the contact information. Uh, all right. So if you want to get in contact with us, you can do so uh, at the Linux Cast on Twitter. You can subscribe to all of our audio feeds and all that kind of stuff at the linuxcast.org. I continually promise a website going on there. I promise I am working on it. I'm making progress. So sometime in 2024, there will be a website. <laughs> <laughs> you can contact via, contact us via email. at the at e- I don't know why the email always trips me up. You can t- contact us via email at email at the linuxcast.com. And the reason why it trips me up is because email's in the email and there's way too many email words in there so uh, um i i do want to go ahead and say i I don't know if it's different did you mean dot org i did did i say dot com yeah you did Uh, i used to own the dot com and then i didn't pay for the the domain and then (laughs) i was like well because we kind of stopped doing the podcast there for like uh six or seven months like chances are ricky and i aren't gonna get back into this was like uh, two years ago and when i came back and realized people are actually listening to those old, old episodes and we started up again with Martin. Uh, like I, I went back to get the domain again and hover was like, yeah, we'll give you that domain. That domain is still available. $800. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> no. <fuck off. laughs> so I just bought the $15.org domain. You're like, fuck off. It's so stupid. Like there just because go. I had that and wanted again, doesn't mean you can charge me $800. It was my idea, just because I didn't, you know, fuck off, it, assholes. <laughs> anyway, if you want to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash linuxcast. You can support uh, Tyler, who goes by Zany on the internet all over the place. You can follow him on Twitter, or not Twitter. I can't do this today. It's just, it's packing it. He's on YouTube. He's on Odyssey. Uh, I, are you you're just going to stay on Odyssey, even though they're, it's a dumpster fire now? Um, I, yes, my content's still getting synced over there. My channel still exists. I pulled out all of my LBC, all that stuff, sold it off. I'm pretty much done with the platform. Um, but yeah, you can still find me over there for sure. Yeah. yeah same thing with the Linux cast. It's still over there. I, I didn't have very much LBC anyway, so I just, fuck it. I don't care. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I think it was like worth, what, four cents uh, an LBC or something? I don't know. Oh. Uh, four cents is probably generous right now. I haven't checked, but it's <laughs> okay. it's not much. All right. All right. So let's just say it's a penny. That means they owe me $2.10. Okay. <laughs> you, you can keep it. You need it more than I do. Anyways, you can find those links to Tyler's stuff in the, the video description or in the podcast description. And you can subscribe to the Linux cast where you'll find a video version of this. If you're not already watching the video version, if you're watching the audio version or whatever, you can do that at the linuxcast.com. I can't talk. It's youtube.com slash linuxcast. I'm just scatterbrained. You remember at the beginning of the podcast where I said I had my shit together? Not true. Mm-hmm. Not true. Complete lies. Uh, you jinxed yourself by saying it. <laughs> I don't, it's always the contact information that trips me up. And the most hilarious thing is it's literally right in front of me. All I have to do is read it. But reading is entirely too hard. It's not something that I learned how to do, apparently, in public school. So I should, maybe if I had that fancy private school app, you know, education like my friends had. You know? if, you, if you spent the real money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the country club education or something. Anyways, uh, so every week, Tyler and I each choose a news link of the week. And this week is no different. So, Tyler, why don't you tell us what you chose this week? Well, so um, I I chose, it's a Tom's Hardware article, and we're not going to dive into it because I haven't read it because it doesn't matter. Just read the title and what's underneath it, because I believe this is absolute comedy gold, okay? So everyone's been wanting the Apple M1 chip, Linux on it, which again, I, I think it's a good thing. However... This article is great. Apple M1 now boots GNOME desktop on Debian Linux. And I, like, I saw that article and I was like, oh, this is, this is very interesting. I went in to read it, but I mean, the subtitle for, for the article says it all. Not great, but usable. (laughs) I'm like, well, when initial support comes, that's normally how it's going to go. You know, it's not great, but it might be usable. 
But uh, real real thing here is apparently Linux is now running on the Apple M1 chip. Has cool. Been, I, I think it has actually been for a while. They just now have gotten GNOME to run on it, right? I might be mm-hmm. wrong yeah. about that. It seems like I read something a couple months ago where because it didn't take them very long to get something running on the M1 chip right it ever came out. Yeah, well, there was just a lot, like, I know it has been able to run on the M1 chip, but now that it's gotten to the point where GNOME will actually, you know, function at least somewhat on it, it it means the support's gotten a lot better. Because I know it, I know you technically could, but I know a lot of stuff was not working. A lot. Which, I mean, if, if you know Apple, it makes sense. Apple doesn't really want you using anything uh, other than Mac. Yeah. Um. Like I under okay, so I understand the interest in doing this, like as a scientific project, and but I don't understand putting resources into it as a usable project because would would somebody actually go out and buy an M1 Mac in specifically to put Linux on it? Like, I mean, if you buy an M1 Mac, you probably just want a Mac, right? I mean, well. There is a valid reason, um, and I'll. It's uh, it's a very subset of a niche. But let's say you're someone who is living off grid, or you know, doing your own solar setup. It makes a lot of sense to to want a, the M1 chip because you get it's such a low TDP, but yet at the same time you get it packs a lot of performance. So for someone who's on a very stringent power requirement uh, for their PC, it does make a lot of sense. The only thing that I still don't know that it still makes a great argument is the fact that, yeah, you might buy an M1 Mac and use less, but the performance, because you're not using Mac where it's optimized for the chip, you lose out on a lot of that performance gain. So just, uh, I mean, it it, it seems like you would just then use Mac. I mean, I, I understand not wanting to use Mac, but then maybe don't buy a Mac. I mean... Mm-hmm. And, and, and 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 here's the main point. Main point here: the Steam Deck's coming. So, 15 watts, and you get. I mean, it can even play games. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Apple hardware. Apple hardware is beautiful, but it's just so expensive. But but I, I make that argument, and then I look at System Seventy Six, and their hardware is just so expensive you know so yeah maybe, maybe, well i mean maybe it's not that it's so expensive it's just that i'm a i'm poor you know <laughs> in comparison to those prices i just don't have that kind of cash right <laughs> i don't think it's poor as, as much as linux linux hardware manufacturers it's almost impossible for them to be able to seriously compete yeah. unless you're valve you know you've got the resources to be able to compete well, get, cause it at a reasonable price point system 76 basically has to go into best buy to get their parts that's the reason why mm-hmm. they have to charge so much uh yeah so i mean i always bitch about system 76 but there's i mean obviously they only sell, sell 12 items a year so yeah, <laughs> they, they, yeah they gotta make their money somewhere all right so um first of all before we move on to the next one i just want uh, gnome why did you choose GNOME? <laughs> I, I mean, you're on a power sipping chip that's meant to be power saving and performance and all this stuff, and you chose GNOME? Uh, oh, here you go. I'm going to go ahead and stop you right there in that argument. You're talking to somebody who originally was using Mac OS. So, I mean, is GNOME really <laughs> that, that bloated I mean, compared to Mac? I mean, but at least Mac OS is. is you know, meant to run on the hardware. I mean, uh, GNOME can't even run good on a Threadripper. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's not true. I mean, GNOME's gotten way better in the last few years, but it's still, I mean, uh, it's still going to use one sixteenth of your memory just at startup. You know, because it's mm-hmm. going to use a gigabyte of memory just to start up. That's the way GNOME works. Uh, why not, I mean, XFCE, LXQt, I mean... <laughs> Uh, a tty based system you know <laughs> so, <laughs> anything other than gnome literally all right anyways so uh speaking of gnome yeah, what about speaking, your article? Yeah, we're going to talk about gnome some more so um gnome 41 it went to beta this week 
And they have some new features. So one of the things that they're they're supposedly doing is that they're changing the settings a little bit so that you can do some more configuring of the multitasking. It's it, it sounds like really good news because GNOME's not known for doing customization at all. So the fact that they're doing some customization is almost blatantly shocking. But mm -hmm. uh, really, this is like the minimum they could do. Um, yeah. So you can go through and disable the hot corner. You can disable the active screen edges, which, first of all, you couldn't do that before. I mean, <laughs> I mean, those that's like basic functionality. You can't turn something off. It's. I mean, maybe you couldn't. They just moved it into multitasking. I don't know. I don't use GNOME. But I'm assuming... Let's be real. This is GNOME. What happens? They take an extension, build it into regular GNOME, and pat themselves okay. on the back. Good job. Somebody else did that work, bro. <laughs> Anyways, you can do dynamic dynamic of fixed number of workspaces. I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's a translation error or something. That doesn't make any sense. A workspace behavior on multi on multi monitors. That was in Tweak Tool, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had to literally like that, and that was. I mean, we could talk about that for a few. Seconds. Who in the absolute? I'm going to try not to go off here. <laughs> Why? If you have multiple monitors. There should be workspaces on it. it. There's no argument for not having it already enabled. It's the dumbest thing ever. Yeah. I, okay. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, by default, the only, if you have multiple monitors, say you have two monitors, by default, the only monitor that has workspaces on it is the first one. Mm -hmm. the, on the second monitor, you get one workspace. That's it. You can't change it. Uh, and they don't want you to change it by default because you literally have to hack the system, which is what GNOME Tweaks is, in order mm -hmm. to get the base of functionality having workspaces on both monitors. And even then, I'm pretty sure once you get that hack in place, it it still does the stupid old GNOME thing where it changes. If you change workspaces, it changes it on both monitors, right? Um, or can you I don't them? believe so. You can change you, them. In, you can change them independently. Okay, because so that's mm -hmm. then that's new because that's the way it used to be. It used to be. When you had you had you had workspaces on both monitors, but you change workspaces on w monitor one, it also changed it on monitor two, uh, and that was also dumb. Uh, it, it, the thing is, maybe we're just rare. I mean, maybe people who use multiple monitors are just not that common, and the GNOME people don't use multiple monitors. Maybe that's the 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 thing. But you'd think, I mean, they're all software developers, and you'd think that most software developers who at least make some money have at least one. Uh, at least two monitors. You'd think so. I mean, because... Well, actually, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I think, uh, from what I've heard, speaking to a lot of people who use GNOME like as their primary de DE, a lot of them will tell you that they actually just don't take advantage of workspaces. So, mm. I, I think that's really common, where that's... it's a feature they build in for the people who do want it, but for most people, it's not even relevant, so they just don't really bother caring about it. Yeah, that's anathema to me. I mean, I just, like, I can't understand it. I use all the workspaces. I know. You need 90 workspaces <laughs> per monitor. As, as it's many, a must. Literally as many workspaces as you could possibly give me, I still could probably use more. <laughs> I'm just saying, I like workspaces. I can't help it. I'm using 14 workspaces right now. I mean, <laughs> across two monitors. I mean... <laughs> I'm using three of my nine. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I, mean, I just... Can't help it. That's the way it works. I mean, the, it, I don't understand... I mean, I guess, I mean, the thing is, I used to be that way, though. When I used KDE, when I was a KDE guy, I didn't use workspaces at all. Um, I, I just had Windows piled on top of each other and had to use Alt-Tab to get through shit. Uh, but once you go tiling Window Manager, it just seems like workspaces are the way to go. Anyways, mm -hmm. not not the topic of the... <laughs> we could do a whole <laughs> podcast on workspaces and then maybe transition into key chords. You know, because it is maybe for my birthday we could do that. <laughs> yes, that that'll be your birthday gift, an entire podcast where we only like we don't do the intro, we don't do the links, we don't do anything, no news, no nothing, just talk about key chords the entire time. Yes, that sounds like a fantastic birthday present. All right, I'm looking forward to March right now. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's the news. We're moving on to the main topic now. If you listened to last week's episode, you'll know that we did not get to the main topic. We uh, bullshitted for about an hour and a half. 
Uh, and we didn't. We, I mean, that was not getting to the main topic. It would have been four hours long if we'd done the main topic. So, but uh, we promised that we were going to do that main topic this week. Well, we lied. Uh, <laughs> what we decided to do is we'll push that main t- that topic that we we're going to do last week to next week, and instead do this week's. Th- we did some topic musical chairs, if you will. We just kind of mm-hmm. rotated things around. So today's main topic is five things we love about Linux and five things we hate. So we're going to start off on the positive note because we wanted to try something new. <laughs> you know, so mm-hmm. uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and forth on these things. So Tyler, name the first thing you love about Linux. Um, I love the fact that it incentivizes alternative uh, some people get upset by saying alternative but it it incentivizes alternatives to proprietary software and it highlights how many great alternatives there are to major pieces of software that people use such as gimp um and well i mean there's plenty more examples but let's be honest gimp is a perfect example you use photoshop if you start using gimp i mean there there might be one percent that that Photoshop does that GIMP doesn't do. It's it's fantastic. It's beautiful and it's free. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. That's a good one. All right. So my first one is that um, Linux kind of forces you to think. And uh, when you use Windows or Mac, you don't have to think about anything. It's just a tool. You do your work. You don't worry about the operating system. You can't do that with Linux. You have to have a brain, at least somewhat. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a bunch of fucking morons in the Linux community as well. I mean, we we every community has them. I are one. All right. I'm just like right here. (laughs) You know. You know. But uh, uh, you you can't use Linux and not at least be somewhat technologically adept. And I like the fact that when you come up across a problem in Linux, it makes you think about it and you can go Google it and you search out problems and solve those problems and all that stuff. And I like that about Linux because when you, like I said, when you're, you, you feel like a drone when you use windows because you're just there to work. You, nope. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you name the two things you use windows for, you use either use it for work or you use it for gaming. Uh, mm-hmm. And those are the only two things you use Windows for. You can do a ton of stuff on Linux that are neither of those things. Uh, and I like the I like that I like the tinkering of Linux. It makes I, I I think that's a great point because Windows really doesn't incentivize you to fix problems. It incentivizes you to pay someone to fix problems for you. Or do what I always do when a Windows problem happens: you can pave that bitch. <laughs> like I don't solve, <laughs> yeah. I don't solve anything on Windows. Like I I could. But why would I want to? It's just so much yeah. easier to go into the settings and say factory reset, you know? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. that's, that's good. And then and then you have to, of course, uninstall McAfee because McAfee comes pre installed. <gasps> Probably also has Norton installed and uh, 12 free games that are just waiting for you to play them. Uh, the Candy Crush uh, Saga, man. That's <laughs> where it's at. Uh, every computer user apparently needs to have Candy Crush Saga. <laughs> like if, if go. you're going to have games in there, at least have something good on there. I don't know what it I mean, bring back Pinball. You know, the yes. from like Windows XP, bring that shit back. That was so good. Um, anyways. Everyone wants it. <laughs> yeah, yes. It was, <laughs> like, it, was, it was great. I mean, paint has stuck around and pinball somehow hasn't. I mean. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. Uh, your next positive, your, your next one you love. Um, it, mine would be, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you were going to say this. So I don't mean to steal a point from you, but I, I just got to the performance overhead is so or um hardware usage i guess is the best way of putting it is so much lower so much lower. like linux the, having any type of operating system that doesn't eat up three over three gigs of ram just to spy on you is amazing like so when when i had a windows partition on my hard drive and i would boot into it once in a while my computer sounded like it was an airplane taking off because the fans would just crank all the way up to 100 for like the first five minutes of being in Windows because that's how long it takes Windows to actually have everything start up in the background. <laughs> it's, it's, and and that's a, a a a thing of Windows that I actually installed. Like that was something I installed. It wasn't like a, a manufacturer stuff where it had a whole bunch of stuff from the manufacturer being installed. This was just like stock Windows, and you still it took like five minutes to. 
This turned into a bashing of Windows thing. Really <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if we're being real, like, the fact that the telemetry inside of Windows takes up so much resources and it doesn't benefit you whatsoever, it benefits Microsoft, but not you, it's sort of insulting. Like, your system should... A, the bloated Linux system is going to eat up, like, what, a gig? Maybe a gig, like maybe if it's real bloated, like a gig in like seventy five, like it, it's not bad. Like yeah, you're not going to be even if you're that using much. GNOME, you can still count on it only using a gig. Like that's the that's our most bloated desktop environment, and uh, we bitch about it. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah like, like we really do. Like, we really do. We bitch when something gets close to two gigs, and Windows is like. I mean, six gigs out of the go is pretty good. You know, at, at least it's not seven. It's like <laughs> yeah. the mindset of a window, Windows user is always really funny. Like, I mean, at least it's not this bad. It's like, well, well I mean, that. Let, let's fa- let, I mean, hold on a second. Let's face it. Most normal Windows users have no clue how much RAM their computer is using. Mm-hmm. They, the only only reason they'd ever find that information out is if they ran out of RAM. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that's the reason why we now have to have laptops that have 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM in it, yeah. uh, you know, because Windows uses that much. Um, so, uh, yes, that that's uh, definitely one. So uh, my next point is that despite the stereotype, uh, I love that for the most part, hardware is just plug and play on Linux. And obviously... Plug and play on Windows 2, and is hardware compatibility on, on Windows is very good. Uh, same with Mac. But as bad as the stereotype is of thinking that the hardware on Linux just doesn't work, for the most part, it's very, very good. So, like, I have a DAC here that's sitting on my computer, on my desk. It's where my headphones plugged in. I plugged it in, it worked. I have an audio interface. You know, it's up there, it's a Scarlet or whatever. Plugged it in, it worked. As much as we bitch about Pulse Audio, those things worked. It was, you know, out of the box. No drivers, nothing like that. Uh, same thing with this little hacky uh, uh, scene switcher thing or whatever that I use to switch scenes in OBS. It's just worked out of the box. And that thing came from uh, like, a, like a rundown warehouse in China. I mean, literally, <laughs> it was 60 bucks on Amazon, and that's way overpriced. Uh, but uh, you should see these keycaps. These keycaps things are like paper thin, but, you know. It worked, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? That's what matters. <laughs> I love that about Linux. And it was one of the things that on, on Linux that I re- was really worried about when I first switched over full time was like, well, I mean, what happens when I want to print something? Can I get my printer to work? Yeah, it works now. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> obviously there are still exceptions to that rule. A lot of printers don't work. A lot of scanners don't work. You have to, Or you have to do workarounds. And uh, okay. there are some distros, Debian, uh, that don't include non-free blobs in their, you know, ISOs. Uh, so you have to go out and search for those things, and and then even then, half the time, shit doesn't work. Uh, but-, but I will go ahead and defend Linux here on that little point. There, printers and scanners, even on Windows, uh, they might work if you plug straight into them, but. Even then, there's going to be there the amount of times that I have literally almost punched a printer. Uh, and I'm using it on Windows too many times to count. Well, let's let's also talk about the fact that if you want to get those things to work, you have to open up a wizard that looks like it was designed for Windows 95 in order to actually get it to work. <laughs> I mean, this is just ridiculous. I mean, and, and they're going to look even stu- I mean, they're going to look even more stupid when Windows 11 comes around, and they, they're going to be have these Windows 98 windows uh, with rounded corners. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> like, it's going to look so stupid. All right, uh, your next one. So uh, my my next one would be the fact that um, Linux does a great, a great job, uh, an absolute great job with incentivizing automating small tasks with scripting on Linux or uh, on Windows. It's a uh, and Mac. You can you can do that, but it's not incentivized whatsoever. Linux, even if you're running something like Linux Mint, it 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 is very much incentivized to automate a lot of the small tasks that you do with simple scripts. And I don't know, like the Linux ecosystem just it, it incentivizes it. It makes it seem worth very worthwhile to learn basic scripting because I mean, if you if you do something all the time in Linux, open up a ton of programs like you know one after the other. 
whipping up a script that does it for you takes almost no time. Uh, even if you know nothing, spend 15, 20 minutes learning a tiny bit of Bash, and you can implement a little script that'll open up all the programs you want with a simple key binding. And it, it it's really nice. I really like that. Mm, that's a good point. Um, all right, so my next one, uh, my third of the of the five, is uh, tiling window managers exist on Linux. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't exist on Windows and Mac. They do, but they're very niche. Right? I mean, very very mm -hmm. niche. And now they're niche on Linux too. But uh, I love tiling window managers with all of my heart. I couldn't be happy. Uh, I was perfectly fine as a KDE. Plasma user. I was like, I was a happy camper. I liked Linux just fine. Uh, then I tried i3. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so good, man. Once you go tiling, you never go back. Mm -hmm. um, and got, just to touch on, you said window manager or tiling window managers do exist for stuff like Mac and Windows. The thing that uh, I don't know if a lot of other people agree with this sentiment, but a lot of the tiling window managers for Windows, I won't even touch or try out. Uh, well, for one, it's on Windows, but two, I don't trust them because a lot, a lot of that type of software is filled with malware. Like yeah. that's the thing about all Windows type UI stuff like that. You like, I don't know if you remember this, but back in the day, CNET had Download.com, and you went to Download.com and you got all these crazy pieces of software, and they all did like cool things, like gave you a, a Mac dock on your Windows machine. And as you install them, uh, along the way, looking perfectly like it's a step of the install process, says, would you like to change your homepage to yahoo.com? <laughs> mm -hmm. Or would you like to install... Oh, oh, you remember search engine bars? That <laughs> yes, <laughs> like the this, nightmare of the, installing like three programs, and then you end up with like seven different task bars in your browser. <laughs> like, God, no. Like you had Yahoo, you had <laughs> AOL, you would have had the Microsoft thing, you probably had Google. I mean, they all had bars. And they were all installed because you had these really cool programs or whatever that you really wanted that made your windows look really snazzy. And it, what they didn't tell you is in order to do that, you had to install a bar. <laughs> you know? So, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how... So, yeah. You're, you're definitely right. A lot of that UI stuff. Now, for Mac, it's not nearly as bad because Mac is based on Unix, which is basically the same thing that, you know, it correlates really well with what Linux does. So, um they have a lot of, uh, or I'm not going to say a lot, but a few tiling window managers that are actually really, really good on Mac, um, but not nearly the breadth and awesomeness that is window or Linux. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, tiling window managers, definitely uh, one of the things I love most about Linux. And uh, if they took the tiling window managers away from me now, I don't think I'd be nearly as happy on, on Linux as I used to be. So Same. Uh, your next one. My next one would be uh, Terminal. The, the terminal on Linux. It's so good and it's so enjoyable to use. And now I know some, some hardcore windows users will just eke out of like ooze out of the like woodwork here and be like, well, our shell exists. The command command prompt on windows is a thing. It, it is, but it's not good. It's not enjoyable. Like, yes, I know you can use it. You can do a lot. System administrators use it and get get their work done in it, but it's not fun. It's not enjoyable to use. The The Linux terminal, You, I don't know. It's just a, you have a world of choice. If you want to do anything, infinite possibilities. It's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Terminal's good. All right. So my last one, wait a minute. I think it's have you been keeping count? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure we're on four. I'm I'm pretty sure. So I still have one after, oh, after this damn. <laughs> <laughs> like, All right, my next one then has to be the thing I'm known for, ricing. Uh, now I understand you can make Windows look prettier than it used to be. Uh, I'm really all saying that much as <laughs> lipstick on a pig, if you ask me. Uh, but there is no other operating system really on the planet like Linux in terms of customizability. Um, and this is obviously really low-hanging fruit in terms of a thing that I love, but uh, I can't help it. I rice things all the time. I mean, it's just literally the thing I my channel is known for is ricing. And I rice stuff all the time. I'm still on Grubbox right now, and I'm happy as a camper. But I'm sure in two or three weeks, days, whenever, I'll eventually cha change it because I enjoy the process 
of, of customizing the look and feel of my operating system. And that's not something you can do nearly as easily on Windows. Uh, they mm -hmm. have preset themes, uh, but unless you're out looking for like a hack to get your computer to look different, uh, changing it to something completely different is much, much harder. So, yeah, and it really does feel like they heavily don't want you doing it. Like, really don't want you doing so it. So, Starduck has existed for a long time. And, and, you know, they're like a respectable company. They make a lot of money. Uh, but that has always felt like a hack. And, uh, mm -hmm. I'm granted, I haven't used it in 15 years. Uh, because, I mean, who the fuck really does? Uh, but <laughs> uh, it used to be, like, it, it would take, like, a like 30% of your system performance just to run that dock. It was the most ridiculous <laughs> thing ever. Uh, so it, that customizing Windows is not, not nearly as fun or entertaining as it is on Linux. So uh, you're, so th we're moving on to five now, right? Yep. All right, so yep. your last one that you love. Um, my last and final point here, um, I, I don't want you... Anybody who's watching this, don't disagree with me here, okay? I know it wasn't always this way, okay? But the software diversity on Linux is amazing. If you want, like, if if you're a diehard FOSS user, there's plenty of fantastic free and open source programs for you. But as well, even with proprietary offerings, nowadays on Linux, Anything you want is most likely going to, unless it's like anti-cheat. If you absolutely need anti-cheat, then fingers crossed Valve fixes that in the next six months, but whatever. The software of it, if you want VS Code, you want Atom, you want anything, you you want Zoom on your on your Linux install, it's there. The software is amazing, if, the, the amount of it. If we could get Adobe to come to Linux, we'd literally have everything we need. Mm -hmm. Literally, Adobe is like the only thing that is it's literally the one thing you'll have that Windows fanboy is going to point out every time you say, well, Linux is really good. Well, well it doesn't have Adobe, so of course it's not good. You know, I mean, that's the, literally the one thing they're going to point out. Like, they might point out Microsoft Office, but at least we can say, well, you know, we have 12 Office suites. They're all good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To varying degrees. Yeah. You know? Uh, the, the one thing I will say, though, is I actually don't know that I want Adobe on Linux. Only because I feel like that would stop incentivizing people to at least try out GIMP. Yeah, it's a like good, it's a good point. Um, but it, it also would bring, I think, more people to Linux. I don't know if we want that. Mm -hmm. I, that's a whole other discussion. All right, my fifth and last one is also low hanging fruit, but I can't help it. It's my absolute favorite thing about Linux, but by far, even more than key chords and. Uh, workspaces. I love this more than anything else. I need to know this. If it's if it's also, better than key chords, need to know it. Itchiest nose in the history of the universe right now. Um, <laughs> random fact right there. Um, anyway, so my favorite thing about Linux is the community. I have met so many people. Tyler and I wouldn't know each other if it wasn't for Linux. I mean, mm -hmm. true story. Like I've talked to DT. He's talked to District Two. Uh, we we met Terminal for Life through Linux. We. I mean, he has a Discord server full of people that he would never have talked to, or talking to, has would have <laughs> never talked to, if it hadn't been because of Linux. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, and it's. I mean, we just have tons of stories like that. I mean, like, just met a ton of people, made a lot of friends. You know, made a lot of acquaintances, gotten helped a lot of people, gotten help from a lot of people. I mean, everybody has this thing, and it's all because of Linux. I challenge mm -hmm. you to find a Windows user who has had that experience. Oh, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure that in the professional reaches of, you know, the universe, people have met people, you know, if you work at Microsoft, you've met people because you work, you use Windows. But if you, outside of that small scenario, the, mo the vast majority of the billion and a half Windows users out there aren't me meeting each other because of Windows. There aren't Windows user groups out there. And if there are... Yeah. I want to I want to sit in on one of those things because that's just I mean that has to be just the height of entertainment. Yeah, well, I, I would kill to be the fly on the wall well, in that there community. I was. Well, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna slip, slip in my Southern hillbilly. Give me a second. <laughs> well, well, there I was. I was fixing my registry. It was oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so horrible. <laughs> okay, uh, so that was five things we loved about Linux. <laughs> All right, now uh, 
that we're gonna have to <laughs> we're gonna have to uh, calm down for a minute. And now we got to talk about five things we hate about Linux. Uh, this is gonna be actually, I think, a little bit harder for us to come up with because we just spent the last twenty minutes in a, a, a sea of positivity, and now we have to turn turn this car around <laughs> and go the other direction. Uh, Stab so, Linux in the back. Yeah, oh no! Fuck you, Linux. You asshole. <laughs> Linux sucks. <laughs> All right. Engaged Lunduke mode. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to put the. We gotta, hold on a second. I got to get make us in black and white. We got to get us in black and white here. <laughs> Because <laughs> all these videos are in black and white. All right. Uh, Tyler, your first thing that you hate about Linux. I'm so glad you let me go first because I know you would have stolen this from me. <laughs> pulse audio. <laughs> Just pulse audio. Need I say more? I don't think I have to elaborate. It. I don't think I have to elaborate. No, you Just... really don't. Pulse audio is horrible. <laughs> uh, it's also really good uh, sometimes. It's, I mean, sometimes. It's, just, it's just fantastic. Sometimes and other times it kills you. Like murder your entire family. Like, uh, let's be honest. Pulse Audio, when it works, mm, beautiful. When it doesn't, oh, God. I just want to <laughs> die. You know? Yeah. It's just so bad. Uh, uh, all right. So, my first one, and I'm going to try to do a better job of keeping, you know, numbers here. Just, uh, my first one is going to be uh, a very niche problem. Uh, my The thing I hate most about, well, not most. One of the things I hate about Linux is display managers. Now, this is like, Matt, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Display manager, just light DM is perfectly fine. GDM is perfectly fine. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe it's because they hate me so much, but I cannot, for whatever reason, get light DM to work on my computer. I can't. Like, literally, I have to, if I, if I distro hop on this main computer, I have to choose a, uh, a distro that shifts with GNOME by default so that it uses GDM. Because I can't get light DM to work. Like, it literally, I, it will probably boot up one time. I'll go in doing the, the initial updates that you always have to do, reboot, and all of a sudden, blank black screen. And the thing is, it's not just Arco, it's not just Arch, it happened on Ubuntu and Debian as well. So, it has something to do with my hardware configuration that just does not like LightDM. Uh, it likes SDDM perfectly fine. GDM is also fine, but if you... On, if you're on a distro that uses Wayland by default, you can't actually install other desktop environments or, or window managers that use XOR because it won't boot into them because GDM, by default, if you're on a Wayland system, uses Wayland uh, by default. And in order to change that, you have to delve into a configuration file somewhere in order to change it. So, yeah, my first one, and the thing that gives me a lot of problems for whatever reason, every time I hop, is uh, display managers. I think... Uh, for the most part, they're kind of stupid. I agree with that. Yeah. So your next one. My second point would be, um, if we're going to be completely honest here, Linux has a real big issue with n the amount of uh, elitism inside of the Linux space. Uh, there is a lot of a lot of people who give Linux a bad name solely because they have an attitude of I'm better than you because I use Linux. Uh, and I think that's something that really is not a necessary problem with Linux itself, but it is because, I mean, that's the impression that a lot of people get of Linux. I don't want to try it out because there's people who think they're better than me for using Linux. Mm. And That's a good point. Uh, that that's definitely uh, a problem, but I use Arch, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I had to. I mean, I just I, I had to. It was literally in the rules. I mean, it's literally written right here. You must use. Must say. This talk, thing. talk about that low hanging fruit, man. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, my next one is going to be. My next one is discoverability so we've been bitching a lot in the last few weeks about debian mainly because i bring it up every week uh I, but i don't want to pick on debian because pretty much every linux distro has this problem to some degree uh because there are so many distros out there how are you supposed to know which one to use 
But mm -hmm. more than that, once you discover which one to use, how are you supposed to know which ISO to download? Especially if there's mm -hmm. like 12 of them. You know, mm -hmm. like, don't get me wrong. Ar Arco Linux, my favorite Linux distribution by far. I use it, I mean, I'd, I'd use it on all my machines and never to switch away. I love it. But you go to their website, they have at least nine different ISOs. Mm -hmm. It's confusing. Right? It, it is. Which one are you supposed to download? Now, <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. They try to do a good job with, with like graphics or whatever to tell you this is what which one it is. But first of all, they need a graphic designer because those graphics they could use some work. They're, they're not good. Uh, like they're they're a mess. We're just gonna put put it out there. Again, love Arco. I mean, it's fantastic. But I, like I feel like I'm I'm dissing a child here, but. Uh, <laughs> You need to pare it down just a bit. Nine ISOs, way too many. Uh, and, and really, they have more than nine ISOs because one of their one of their versions of ISOs has an ISO for every single desktop possible that you could install. So uh, again, new Arco is not for new users. But and, and the thing is, it's not just Arco. It, Ubuntu has the same problem, not quite to that degree, but they have four or five different ISOs. Which one are you supposed to choose? Now, granted, if you just hit the download button on, on Ubuntu.com, you're going to get the proper ISO. Uh, mm -hmm. It's only when you go searching for something different that you're going to discover the other ISOs. But um, Linux Mint has three different ISOs on their download page. Uh, and, and then you click on it, you have to know what a mirror is. Uh, if you don't know what a mirror is, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Uh, and, I mean, chances are if you've burnt, if you've learn how to burn an ISO, you probably can figure out what a mirror is. But again, it's just a level of difficulty for new users that just doesn't exist on Windows because mm -hmm. nobody installs Windows. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Unless you're a technical technological person, you're solving a problem for another person. The way you get Windows is you go to Best Buy, you hop out of your car, you go back there, you ignore the 12 salespeople that try to sell you iPods or whatever on the way, and then you discover, A, they don't have the laptop that you they had an ad advertisement because they're always out of those advertisement things. Uh, and so you, you compromise and you bypass the Chromebooks, even though they look really pricey, you know, good prices. Um but you don't know what the fuck a Chromebook is, uh, you know. So <laughs> you find yourself a, a Windows laptop, and that is how you get Windows. After you, you know, you bought your laptop and told the salesperson, "Fuck no, I don't want the extended warranty." No, really, I don't want the extended <laughs> warranty. Seriously, dude, I don't want the fucking extended warranty. What the hell is wrong with you? you know? For the sixteenth time, I don't need it. Trust me. And, and then what you convince them that you don't want the extended warranty? Hey, would you like to sign up for our credit card? <laughs> <laughs> would you like? Would you like our rewards program? You know, <laughs> I just wanted Windows. Why can't I get Windows? <laughs> so, I, 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 on second thought, figuring out which ISO of, of Linux you want sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I should. I should get a. I mean, seriously, uh, some kind of Oscar for that performance. That was really good. <laughs> All right, Tyler, your next one. I My believe, next I one. This is three, right? Yes, okay. we're on three. I'm glad that and one of us can count. <laughs> <laughs> for for my third one here, it's going to be a. Um, it, some people might say this ties back to my last point, but I I think it's I think it deserves its own point. Um, even though there's great software availability on Linux, it's there is software that is off limits on Linux. Like if if you're using certain pieces of software inside of the Linux space, most people unless again you you're like us and you have fan like a, a lot of the linux community is very fantastic in every community there's going to be bad actors bad apples that's that's a thing but inside of the linux space if you're using something like edge matt you can attest to this people won't some people won't even talk to you much less help you with an issue in they, edge they or whatever walking down the road and they literally cross the street just so they didn't have to walk past my <laughs> edge using ass you know <laughs> it's <a> true story <laughs> yeah. there is software inside of the linux space that's just it's for some reason uh, well i mean it's not for some reason people have their reasons and it's pretty easy to understand most of them but there's software that's just off limits yeah, if you, arbitrarily. If you use it, you're going against the FOSS code, and mm -hmm. those FOSS bros are going to come out of the woodwork and say, "Oh my God, unsubscribe!" You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yep. A, uh, yeah, that's that's that that's definitely an issue. All right. Uh, 
uh, so my next one, I've forgotten what my next one is. Um, uh, come on, Matt. We, we should have made this three each. And then it would have been perfectly <laughs> fine. It was, five is just way too many. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. This is, this is going to be stupid because I can't remember what the hell it is. I've come completely blank. All right. Um, give me a second. This is dumb. Alzheimer's is going, is, is creeping up on it. Like I'm, I'm getting really close to that 40 year old mark. And then, you know, <laughs> um, oh, oh, just, just start taking some, uh, some, and some, uh, by, by the way, just because you're talking about memory and stuff, just in case anyone's watching this, if you've never tried lion's mane, it's a, like they sell it as a supplement, but it's really just a mushroom. Um, you can get lion's mane and it helps a tremendously with memory. I've started taking it very recently and it does help a lot. My memory is getting better and better. That's which is, Maybe next hey. time you'll be able to remember what I was trying to talk about. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, I, I remember. Thank goodness. All right. So I absolutely despise, and this isn't really a Linux problem. This is more of a, a software developer problem. Uh, but I despise developers that will take a, 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 a electron and go through and make a website into an application. Like, okay, mm-hmm. that requires zero effort. And I got, like, I think everybody who uses Slack and needs to use it on Linux is perfectly happy that Slack is, actually exists. But that thing is just your website. That's literally mm-hmm. all it is. It's just a website. Um, same thing with Discord. You know, just I, mm-hmm. the Discord. It's an Electron app. I, I think it's an Electron app. And I don't even know. It acts even like if a, it's not, the client is pretty damn close it, to the it website. It acts like an Electron app. That's the reason why I don't mm-hmm. know because we just assume that it's an Electron app because it acts like an Electron app. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, all right. So here's another thing. I have a Todoist. I use the Todoist app. It's for my to-do apps. I like it. And I haven't switched away from it because it, sw- it, it syncs with my phone. And finding a Linux, an open source based to do app that will sync with your phone easily without having to do like sign up for next cloud instance or some you know stupid shit, uh, is really hard. So I used to do this because I've used it for years and it's good. But it's an Electron app, and that thing uses three gigabytes of memory if you leave it open for very long. Holy crud! Yeah, like I could probably look at it right now, but. It, 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 Yesterday, when I was making that cute browser video, and I discovered that cute browser was using ten gigabytes of memory, that didn't shock me so much, mainly because browsers always use a ton of memory. Uh, I mean, seriously, Firefox. I I talked about the, the the memory leak in Firefox being gone, but it's really not all that gone. It's just better than it used yeah. to be. Uh, yeah, but, it's much better, but still exists. Yeah, uh, the thing I I was looking at like. Why the hell's Todo is using three gigabytes of memory? It's literally doing nothing other than s- s- showing to do apps or, or to do items. That's literally all it's doing. <laughs> it's a, why is it using it's, it's a it's a literal list, and that's all it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seriously, I I'm not a Bash programmer. I could code that shit in Bash. You know, <laughs> like, like if I could figure out how to to synchronize a Bash script between this and my phone, I would do it, and then I could d- ditch this thing. But that's the thing is, it's basically just the website. And for whatever reason, uh, Electron decides it likes memory and it eats all of it. Like that's your, <laughs> everybody asks me why Matt, why do you have sixty four gigabytes of memory? This is why. Okay. There's a reason. Uh, okay, and, and it's not just on Linux. This happens on Windows too when you use an Electron app too. But Electron is terrible. So that uh, that's my my third one. I think it's no. the third one. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I will say because people will be like, well, there's Electron apps on Windows. Yes, but they're not as prevalent as they are on Linux. Um, a lot of Linux op- like software, you'll be surprised just how many Electron apps there are for Linux. It, there's I mean, a lot. There's just something about Linux that causes the software developer to want to take a shortcut to get their application on here. And I understand that not a lot of people that use Linux relative to Windows, and you're not going to make a lot of money if you put your app on, on Linux. Like I understand that. I can fully understand that you want to take uh, we should just be happy the fact that these things exist. We sh- and we, I am happy, uh, but I can also complain with the fact that um, Electron sucks and it takes up all your memory. Fix. I mean, I wouldn't even care if they're just copies of your website if it didn't also take up enough memory to run a small house. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's, just, yeah. it's dumb. Anyways, uh, your next one, number four. Uh, the number four would be the fact that. In Linux, there is going to be there's a lot of distributions where stuff like Wi-Fi 
and things like that just can't they can be provided but they just won't uh that's something that i and this some people might say this is not a problem with linux and it technically isn't but when it comes to linux adoption i find it very annoying that there are certain distributions that you have to be iffy about recommending to a new user like debian because debian i've i've said this before and i'll say it again it is a beautiful. It is a really good distro for new users. However, it's set up in a way where a new user goes to their website and clicks download and nine times out of 10, Wi-Fi ain't going to work. There's going to be this, this, and that that won't work because you need the non-free ISO. Right. And you, The thing is, if you download that one that they promote on their front page of their website, it will tell you on the second step of their install to go to the website, download something else, and install and then find it in the file system. Like, oh, this is new user-friendly. This is so dumb. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, I mean, that's just one thing that I, I think definitely needs to be uh, addressed inside of Linux in some form or fashion. Uh, yeah, Wi-Fi and that kind of stuff on ISOs is definitely a bigger problem than it should be. Now, the main distros seem to do it fairly well for the most part nowadays uh, but once you get off a little bit more of the i mean the thing is i mean again we're going to beat up on debian but Debian's not off the beaten path you know what I mean? it's not so, it's not like, people are gonna i mean people you switch into linux chances are the first thing you're going to look at is is wikipedia i mean it's probably the first thing you're going to notice and because you're going to search for Ubuntu, but you don't really want to get your information directly from Ubuntu. So you go to Wikipedia because everybody gets all their information from Wikipedia. And in the first paragraph of Wikipedia, the Ubuntu entry for Wikipedia, it says based on Debian. So people are going to see that and think, well, you know what? I'm just going to use the mothership. Cause exactly. It a makes sense. Why based on it. And uh, you install it and you have, I mean, the thing, the, I mean, well, it sounds cliche, but you never get a first chance to make a. A second chance to make a first impression. And mm -hmm. if, if you're switching from Windows to Linux and you have the experience of your Wi-Fi not working, which is like having buying a car and your tire is not working. Mm -hmm. This is literally a functionality that has got to work. Uh, because mm -hmm. I made fun of Windows 11 for requiring the Internet to be installed. But you want to know what? You can't install Linux without the Internet either. I mean, for the mo I mean... You for can, the most part, yeah. You can, you you can you can contact Linux Mint and they'll send you a USB key in order to install Windows or, or Linux. It'll work, uh, and that's fine. But the vast majority of things you do on a computer these days require the internet. Uh, and the thing about Debian is Debian is a freaking net install, so it requires mm -hmm. Wi-Fi to install. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. so the fact that they don't include the necessary drivers for, like, I can understand graphics drivers. Like, I understand not wanting to include NVIDIA drivers, whatever. Mm -hmm. Fedora doesn't do that either. I mean, there's a ton of distros that just won't include NVIDIA stuff in their code. But Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi's got to work. It has got mm -hmm. to work. And mm -hmm. the fact that it doesn't, it's just bullshit. It's the, it's the dumbest thing in the history of the universe. <coughs> so now your fourth point yeah good to, uh, you think i have a fourth point <laughs> um all right so my next point is uh, i i feel like i'm beating a dead horse here but i hate gnome with a passion uh, I, I i i will say that gnome has gotten better in the last two years in terms of performance uh, and but my argument there is that the reason why it's gotten better is because they've taken so much shit out of GNOME, it can help but go faster. You make mm -hmm. your car lighter, it's going to go faster. Uh, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> make it better. You're going to crash into something and it's going to fold like a piece of paper. Uh, but <laughs> I keep coming to the car analogy. But uh, my biggest problem with GNOME, I mean, a lot of people have a problem with GNOME because of their political stances. I don't give a shit if they don't like Richard, Richard Stallman. You can dislike people for whatever reason. Uh, I personally don't think that organizations should take political stances at all, but whatever. I don't care. My problem with GNOME is that they're anti-customization, which to me parallels to anti-Linux. Because uh, I don't need c 
complex customization options in a desktop environment. I don't need them, uh, but I want some choice. I, I don't want to feel when I do get into those customization options that I'm doing something wrong, that I'm doing something naughty, uh, that I'm hacking my system in order to change the font. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's so restricting, and it's when you think of Linux, you don't think of restricting. You think of open. <laughs> That's literally mm -hmm. in the title. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the and the fact that they they restrict you to this one way of doing things. It's our way or the highway, or you have to hack it in order to actually get it to work. It just completely turns me away. It's and it's always going to turn me away because. Like I said, I think that KDE in a lot of time, you know, in a lot of ways takes their customization way too far. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. use KDE is not really a new user friendly desktop environment because they have so many options. Mm -hmm. uh, Pop into their settings menu and try and convince me that it's elegant and very laid out, straight and forward. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No. Uh, I mean, it makes fine. It makes a fine second desktop environment, but. It, the first one, when you're just switching to Linux, not a great experience because it has way too many choices. Things are buried in weird places. I mean, it's gotten way better, again, but it's definitely a lot more complex than it needs to be. But then you have GNOME that says, literally, you can't customize anything. We don't want you to have any options whatsoever in terms of how this works at all. Even going so far, at least until GNOME 41 comes out, saying that if you have multiple monitors, you can't have multiple workspaces. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you just can't. You want a dark mode? You can't have a dark mode. Sorry. Uh, I, even Elementary OS, which is almost as restrictive as GNOME is, finally decided to have a dark mode. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh -huh. and, and, yeah. and when they did it, they did it really well, and they even expanded the customization so you could change accent colors. I mean, mm -hmm. how long do you think it's going to be, Tyler, before GNOME decides that they're going to let you have accent colors? That ain't ever going to oh, happen. Oh, never, never. Yeah, that's never uh -uh. going to happen. That's my problem with GNOME right there is because you don't have the sense that they're working towards something that's, you know, uh, better and more customizable in the future. It may, if, if Their direction feels like they're getting more and more restrictive, not going towards the point of actually increasing customization. That's why when I saw this GNOME, uh, this GNOME 41 thing where it says you can just start to disable parts of the 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 desktop environment. I was like, holy shit, there's no way that's true. That's fake news. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. just... I, I can't stand... Like, the, the thing is, is... I think that if you had some customization options, if, if GNOME Twix was installed out of the box and wouldn't it feel like a hack, GNOME could be good. You know, it could mm -hmm. be good. I mean, GTK apps... Much prettier than a lot of KDE shit. And a lot of mm -hmm. KDE stuff looks like it was developed in 1998. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's just tr true. And, and I, KDE gets so tripped up in terms of having all this customization options that a lot of their default options look like garbage. Uh, mm -hmm. And K-Mail is one of those things. You really have to make customize K-Mail in, in a certain way in order to make it look like it came from this century. You know? It's, yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, GTK apps look way better. But somehow mm -hmm. GNOME takes that and ruins it by not allowing you to do at least a little bit of customization. I'm not asking for everything, just something, a dark mode. Just a, just a wee bit. And also just make GNOME tweaks not feel like, like, don't, the way they treat GNOME tweaks, it feels like if you use GNOME tweaks, you're doing something wrong. Like you're, you're a bad actor in the Linux space. Well, like, same on. thing for extensions, right? I mean, for years, mm -hmm. if you want it to... You can't have icons on the desktop right now without an extension. And uh, unless you're using Fedora, getting an extension to actually work feels like a hack. And mm -hmm. even if you are using Fedora and you have the extensions app, you can't install an extension from the extensions app. You have to install a browser plugin in order to actually install that extension. That's the that's I mean, we could look at, at a dictionary at a dictionary and look up the word jank and that would be right <laughs> next door to it. You know, that is the mm -hmm. jankiest solution ever. To have to install a, a tweak to your desktop environment from a browser extension. Now, mm -hmm. offering oh, that, oh yeah, and and how trustworthy can that be? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it, it just feels like so, I mean, it feels like something Microsoft would do. I mean, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, just it, just a little bit. It feels like in order to get this thing on Windows, you have to go to a website and download a .exe file in order to get it to work. Mm -hmm. It's. I mean, 
they've put so many, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, they just put so many roadblocks in front of customization that it, when you do try to get to that point, because, I mean, eventually you're going to want a dark mode or switch away from that, await the icon thing, which is, I mean, it, okay. Last thing I'm going to say about GNOME. I don't want to go on for an hour about GNOME. <laughs> but if you're not going to go through and allow customization, at least choose an icon theme that doesn't look like somebody shat it out of their ass. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? <laughs> it's so bad. Add a wait there or whatever the hell that thing is called. That icon theme is so bad. It's literally the worst it's icon garbage. theme ever. I'm not a graphic designer. I mean, not even a tiny bit. I mean, it's, I'm not... A, <laughs> like, I can open up GIMP. And that's about as far as my graphic design ability goes. Uh, I could ins I could design an icon set better than those, and that mm -hmm. I mean, literally that's how bad they are. Okay, uh, what number are we on? I don't even remember. Five. Oh, we're thank on the last God, one. On the last one. <laughs> yep. God. Uh, what's your fifth? What's your fifth one? So my final one would be duplication of effort in Linux. It is a major issue that is really overlooked. I mean, a lot of people will say that duplication of effort is not a bad thing, but it really is. Inside of the Linux space, if we're being honest, a lot of stuff could be 30 times better if there weren't 15 other teams of people doing the same damn thing, recreating it from scratch. Just pull your efforts all together. Like the the biggest the biggest duplication of effort thing that I think is the dumbest thing is GIMP having that fork where they just changed the name to Glimpse and they're trying to do their own stuff there. Instead of getting uh, for one, it's an acronym. Okay, it's, it's learn what an acronyms are. Stop being upsetty spaghetti over stuff that really doesn't matter. It's an acronym. And put your effort into benefiting GIMP, making the UI better there instead of having why or have a good reason to fork something just because you don't like the name of something is not a good reason to fork something it's not okay i don't mm -hmm. care how offensive gimp the name gimp is first first of all it came from a movie okay so mm -hmm. <coughs> um you know so just having an uh you know a name that you don't like not a good reason to fork something now if there was something wrong with gimp that you want to change or if you had an idea that would improve the way GIMP works, but the GIMP folks didn't want to implement it. Good reason to fork something. Uh, a name, not a good reason. Um, yeah, no. I, I agree. The duplication of epithet thing, it's kind of a double-sided sword because we all like the fact that there's a ton of choice in Linux. We all like that, but we also kind of feel like uh, uh, some things, at least, uh, really shouldn't need to be developed. Um, all right, so my last one is going to be old, called Old Ass Shit. And... Uh, my idea for this came from PPAs. So if you use Ubuntu or Debian and you want to install software that's not in the Ubuntu or Debian repositories you and you're not interested and in, say you were using this before snaps and flat packs were really a thing, you'd have to go searching for on the internet for a PPA. It's a shitty system. We can all agree on that. It, even the mm -hmm. people who came up with PPAs didn't like it. You know, that's the reason why flat packs and snaps exist. They wanted a central repository for stuff. Uh, the, the the thing is, is that PPAs represent a thing I hate really bad in Linux, is that uh, shit gets banned, right? These these PPAs and stuff, they get abandoned. And you install that software, you're getting old-ass software. And it could potentially hurt your system. Now, I'm pointing out PPAs, but that's just because it represents the thing. The same thing happens in the AUR, my, my baby. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? There's a ton we of, all love the AUR, right? You know, like, like, like I, I, could, I, if it was legal, legal in the state of Michigan, I would marry the AUR. <laughs> you know, that's how much I love the AUR. Uh, but there is a ton of software in the AUR that has been abandoned, and you can install install that shit. Uh, and there is still modern programs that are getting updated to this day that are relying on libraries and packages that haven't been updated in years because they're in the AUR. Um, mm -hmm. and for new users, no matter what distro you choose, it, it, you're going to find the software and you're going to install it and you're going to have problems because that stuff hasn't been updated in forever. Now, uh, a lot of times this stuff can be uh, negated for like PPAs. A lot of the PPA stuff, if you don't update your PPA for a little while in terms, it, it won't install on newer versions of Ubuntu. Sometimes, uh, they have that setting. 
that uh, the AUR really doesn't have that uh, uh, functionality built into it. If it's in the AUR, you can install it. It's just at your own risk. Uh, so uh, my thought is, and my solution to this would be, at least in terms of the AUR, because the AUR does have maintainers. Um, if, if the package hasn't been updated in, say, five years, kick that shit out of there. Or put it into a, like a, a super old AUR bin or something like that that you have to subscribe to in your pacman.comp file in order to actually get to. You know, I think that that'd be a really good idea and it would save a lot of heartache and pain because a lot of those packages are going to break shit when you install them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or, or, or you're... Like if you say you install a, a Twitter application that hasn't been updated in five years because you want a t- Twitter application, chances are that's not going to connect to the Twitter API and you've installed it and you've wasted your time. If that thing was mm-hmm. in a different portion of the AUR that's kind of fenced off and still available, but you know you know that if you get to that stuff, it hasn't been updated in a long time. Yeah, and you're like uh, it, it would be a much better indicator of you're on your own. You yeah. know, yeah, like if you install this stuff, the v- developers either moved on to greener pastures or he's dead. You know, you know those are the, those are the <laughs> options. Apparently, those are the only two options. You know, um, but anyways, I mean, I, I'm not saying that people can't abandon stuff because you know it's going to happen. I mean, you're going to get a job at Intel or you're going to get a job at Apple or something like that, and you're not going to you're not going to be developing your Twitter application anymore. It's fine. It happens. Congratulations Ooh. on your new job, by the way. You know, uh-huh. uh, but <laughs> pull that shit down. If if you th- if you're no longer going to be maintaining it and you can't find someone to take over for you pull it down i mean yeah. it, it's i mean as a developer it's your responsibility not to abandon stuff uh or at least the leave stuff up there that's not going to be maintained because especially if it's mission critical software and stuff like that if it's not going to get maintained you should pull it down uh, mm-hmm. or at least search for another maintainer i mean and a lot of developers do search for other maintainers and just can't find them uh, but in that case, you should archive your project and and make sure people know that this thing is not going to get maintained, is not going to get any more updates, and that is part of your responsibility. I think, at least I feel, as a as a software developer. I completely agree. But I will go ahead and and give a lot of developers this credit. A lot of them do, even if they're continuing to leave it up, do put notices in there that like, hey, this is not being maintained. Yeah. Uh, use at your own risk. It, and that's another uh, but problem. Still. Another problem with AUR is that uh, they may have given that notice. They may have archived their GitHub project, but the AUR still has that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and the AUR is not going to tell you anything about no, it. It's, it's just going to be like hey, install. install. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, if you use something like Paru or something like that, that will tell you if a package has been abandoned or man, you know hasn't been updated in a long time. Uh, so there are AUR helpers that'll do this, but not a lot of people use those. Uh, they're going to use something so. like Yay or or, or pack a U R or something, you know, so I mean, uh, the U R does have that problem. And, uh, so that's definitely uh, something that I really dislike about Linux because I'm always finding applications like for the applications of the month, uh, thing that I do, uh, you know, I, I install something and I'm like, Oh, this is a really cool application. Then I realize that it hasn't been updated since 2006, you know, <laughs> Like oh, I can't, just a I, minor problem, you like, know. I, like I can't recommend this to people on the on the channel because it hasn't been updated in forever, you know. So that's a problem. Mm-hmm. All right. Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> getting getting both of our five things that are negative against Linux that was a struggle. Uh, yeah, m- mainly because I got I, I think I had such a hard problem because I got so involved in talking about yours too that I kind of forgot what I was going to talk about next. So that was a problem. And then I'm in desperate need of water. Like I'm <laughs> like, I, like I'm drying up into a prune because I need something to drink. But uh, we're not done yet. All right. So, uh, if you stuck through that all hour plus of it, first of all. Welcome to the party. We're just getting started. <laughs> I hope we're not just getting started. I really need this to end. All right. So the last thing we do each week is we do picks of the week. So each week we each pick one thing, hence the word pick, that uh, we found interesting or uh, that we are using that we haven't used before. So Tyler, what is your pick of the week this week? Mine would be a nice, beautiful little script called Pokemon Dash Color Scripts. Uh, You can do a little Googling and you'll find it on GitHub. It is a fantastic script. If you're like me and you, you 
used to play a crap ton of Pokemon. You play it off and on from time to time. If you would like to get your favorite Pokemon in your terminal, or hell, just get random Pokemon every time you open up your terminal, it's awesome. I have my nice little Squirtle in my terminal. Every time I open it up, it's beautiful. I love it. It's completely useless. You're not really gaining anything by using it, but it does look nice. I like it. It does look nice. Now, are all the Pokemon there or just a, like a few? As far as I know, all of them. There's so, a lot. I wanted like, I think the name of it was like Charmander or something. Oh, the fire breathing one. That one's there? Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going yep. to install this. That's definitely going to happen. Uh, uh, I <laughs> I've been using a Fetch Master 6000 for too long. I need to change change it up. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's really cool. Um, I saw that on Unixporn, by the way. So I, I thought about that day. So uh, my pick of the week is one that I've talked about. is Cute Browser. And I made a video about this, and I will link it to link to it in the video description. But um, I thought when I, you know, on Sunday night I did the stream about Cute Browser, I thought, you know, well, maybe I'll last a day. You know, I'll miss something about Firefox. There will be something like that. But, nope, I'm still enjoying Firefox or uh, Cute Browser a lot. I mean, I am really, really, really enjoy it. Um, and, yes, yes, there are a lot of websites that just won't render it. I don't, I don't care. Well, you've gotten past that. I, like, I love the fact that I can go through. I mean, you, you can't see this, Tyler, but if you're watching the video uh, thing, you can see this. I can hide the tabs. Like, they can... All that Chrome, completely gone. And I've spent years trying to get Firefox down to as little Chrome as possible using the user Chrome stuff, CSS stuff. And you mm-hmm. can't, I mean, it's not, if you can, but it's really hard to get rid of everything. Uh, mm-hmm. and the fact that I can get rid of everything just uh, makes my little tiling window manager heart just a flutter. Mm-hmm. It's so good. Um, so, yeah, Cute Browser, I don't really have much to say about that. I didn't say about it in the video, but um, it's just, it's so good. And I'm still using it. So, uh, take that, Peter. Five days. <laughs> he said four or five days. If I make it till tomorrow, I win something. I don't know what I, I win. Uh, maybe he has to install Arch. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Peter's going to like that I one. Hope but... I, I, I think it's, I, don't, I didn't agree to this. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that is the, so those are our picks of the week. Coming up next week, next week we are going to f- circle back to that topic we had last week, which is, was. Uh, I don't even remember what it was. Uh, Something about gaming on Something Linux. Something about native gaming. We're going to talk about native gaming on Linux. Uh, that should be fun. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us, we covered all that stuff at the beginning, but at the LinuxCast on Twitter, patreon.com slash LinuxCast. Before I go, I'd like to take a moment to thank my current patrons. Uh, Devon, Chris, East Coast Web, Gen 2 is fun too. Marcus, Meglin, Sven, Jackson, Knife and Tool, Joshua Lee, Mitchell, Mr. Fox, Arch Center, American Camp. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. 